It's time to talk sports. It's Hacksaw's Headlines. A panorama of the world of sports. Stories, comments, and opinions. Now, here's iconic sports talk show host Lee Hacksaw Hamilton and co-host John Riley. It's a Monday up and down the West Coast. Who wants to talk sports? We do. Good afternoon, everyone, from our Dixieline Lumber and Home Center studios in San Diego. We welcome you to our bonus Monday podcast. This is Lee Hacksaw Hamilton, along with my host from left field, <laughs> John Riley. We're going to be here for the next hour. We are going to talk sports with you. An unbelievable number of things to discuss on our bonus Monday broadcast. And John, before we get started let's introduce the people who are new to our live stream because we do this mondays at 3 p.m thursdays at 3 p.m those who are new explain to them how they join our team for the end of the broadcast and what we have termed fans forum fans forum this is where you can get involved if you got a question or a comment for hacksaw just type it in the live chat on facebook or youtube you'll appear on our screen we'll get you involved in the fans forum segment at the conclusion of hacksaw's headlines And a reminder, we urge you, we invite you, we mandate you, we want you to share with everybody that's in your contact book. Tell them about Hacksaw's Headlines podcast, what we do on Mondays, what we do on Thursdays. Tell them to subscribe. And you got time on your hands? Give us a thumbs up and we'll take the five-star rating. So (laughs) go search that out and hit that. And by the way, if you like sports check my website. That's the address right across the top of the screen, leehacksawhamilton.com. I write on it every day of the week. If I can have 12,000 people sampling what we do on Instagram and north of 3,000 already as subscribers for our podcast, you got time. Go check my written website. John, we got a lot of topics on the table. Where do you want to start? Well, first of all, it's 13,500 on Instagram. It keeps growing every day. All right. Hey, it was a wild and wacky weekend in the NFL. I mean, we got to start there. And then there were none. No unbeaten teams left. I went through the schedule on Friday night, and I tried to pick out games that I might want to look at, check in on. I could hardly find any. I only found one that really intrigued me. San Francisco, Cleveland. The rest of the games were terrible. And it played out that way because I track all these games during Sunday afternoon and Sunday morning early starts. Miserable football, field goal kicking contest, turnovers. (laughs) Oh, it was just awful. And then we get to Sunday night and we have an upset and then a near upset in the final game on the weekend. You know, I tried to figure out, how could all these games be so bad simultaneously? Conclusion? Had to be the eclipse. (laughs) It it was a lot of lousy football yesterday. Okay, let's start about the last unbeaten going down the drain. 49ers lose to the Browns. Jake Moody misses two field goals, had been rock solid up to that point. Michigan rookie went left, went right. 49ers winning streak over. Brock Purdy's winning streak, over. Now they're hurt on top of getting hurt by the Cleveland Browns. They lose Christian McCaffrey, oblique injury. Debo Samuel re-injures his shoulder. Offensive line could not protect Brock Purdy. He really had anemic numbers. He kind of looked panic-stricken. He manages games, but he didn't manage the pass rush very well. 125 yards passing, touchdown, interception, They just didn't play very well in that game. And then how in the world do you explain the 49ers losing to an unemployed refugee quarterback from the XFL (laughs) by the name of P.J. Walker, who's running around with his hair on fire, thrown into all types of coverage, got balls picked, should have had other balls picked, probably could have had five picked in the game, but he got Cleveland the win. And it's a Cleveland team that doesn't have its quarterback, does not have its top heavy-duty running back, but it does have its defense. And its defense really beat the 49ers off the ball. I mean, it was a bad game. Now, that, that was not the only one. Then the Eagles, the Eagles, the Eagles who are in the Super Bowl, <laughs> lose to the Jets. And they lose to their quarterback, Zach Wilson. you got to be kidding me. Jets played out of their mind. They got after Jalen Hurts. He threw three interceptions. He was throwing balls into coverage that you don't think a Super Bowl quarterback would do. 
I mean, it was really a stunning Jets power defensive win over Philadelphia. And then we got to Sunday Night Football, and you got the lowly New York Giants, who have virtually no offensive line. The quarterback is hurt. The Giants ramped it up defensively and went after Josh Allen. The Giants nearly knocked the Bills off. They knocked Josh Allen's offense out of rhythm during the course of the game. They got killed at the end of the first half, killed at the end of the second half. Brian Dable and his quarterback and his play calling had the ball to one yard line in the final possession of first half, could not score, could not get the play off. Final possession in the game to win the game that turned out to be a field goal kicking contest, could not put it in the end zone because of formation problems, etc. So the Giants lost that game, not so much that the Bills won the game. And then you got the Raiders New England. Thank you, Daniel Carlson. Who's he? Longtime Raider kicker. He saved their bacon in a game that they could have lost at home. Uh, Jimmy Garoppolo plays the game, manages the game, gets hurt playing the game. He's got a back injury. They fear there might be some type of internal damage also from the back injury. Your guy, Brian Hoyer, third string, 38-year-old, <laughs> should be filing for Medicare soon. Throw comes off the bench, throws for 122, and the Raiders somehow beat New England, and New England is now 1-5 and five on the season. And Mac Jones played better, but not enough to win the game. So it was, in all honesty, it was the strangest weekend. I'm glad I didn't go out to look at the eclipse. I just saw it all on my TV. It was really bad football. Reaction. Reaction. So, um, hey, Cleveland fan, how does it feel to wake up and, like, feel good the next day? I mean, it's been a long time for the Browns, for Browns fans to feel good about their team. This was a huge win for them, um, you know, especially at home, in the dog pound. Um, you know, so what a game. And it's isn't it remarkable that Brock Purdy, you know, with the exception of the NFC Championship game, has been undefeated as a starter. And really, in that championship game last year, he like was out after, what, five or six plays? Yep. Or so. so does that really even count? I mean, he's been more or less undefeated. Um, so you figure at some point they were going to have a bad game. And that, that we talked about the Cleveland defense and how good they were on holding teams on third downs and the completion percentage was so low. So it surprised me, but it didn't surprise me that the Niners finally lost. Well, San Francisco just wasn't the same. And, of course, when you lose CMC at running back and you lose Debo at wide receiver, now all of a sudden it's a very different offense and Purdy couldn't handle the rush and the offensive line just got beat off the ball and they blitzed up inside through the gaps. They beat him off the edge. I mean, a quarterback was under siege. So it was a surprising substandard performance by San Francisco. But when you lose two years, three superstars, that probably is the description as to why why that happened. Okay, we go from there, because there might be a game that might save the whole we lost weekend <laughs> in the National Football League, and it's tonight. Chargers, Cowboys, Monday Night Football. Give us Howard Cosell, <laughs> Frank right. Gifford, Dandy Don. Lights out. Party's over. Headline. That's right there on the money. <laughs> Justin Herbert versus the number two pass defense in the National Football League. You got Kellen Moore, the new offensive coordinator, against Mike McCarthy, the Cowboys head coach who let Moore leave. That'll be fascinating to see. But you got Herbert trying to throw downfield against a defense that doesn't give you throws downfield. Justin Herbert has got seven touchdowns, only one interception this season, but they're not hitting chunk plays. And that's the most surprising aspect to the launch of this Bolt season that I thought Herbert with Kellen Moore would equal a lot of stuff downfield. Hasn't happened because they haven't protected him well. There is no Charger running game. The Austin Eckler finally comes back to the lineup after missing four-plus weeks with a high ankle sprain. Dallas has got a really good pass rush led by Demarcus Lawrence. Dallas has got really good DBs. They really run, and they really cover. They got Micah Perkins. You can I'm a Micah Parsons. You can line him up anywhere, and you better find out where he is because you're going to have to put blockers mm -hmm. there. So that chess match of where is Micah Parsons, a linebacker, number 11, and what's he going to do when the ball is snapped, that's going to be fun watching. Bolts are averaging 388 yards per game. That's pretty impressive. But their defense has given up 403, 
If you look in the stat chart, you can locate the Chargers right at the bottom. 31 in defense, 32 in pass defense. <laughs> now, I can't explain Dak Prescott and the Cowboy offense because it doesn't look the same to me. You look on paper and you see Brandon Cooks, C.D. Lamb, and Michael Gallup. Those are three pretty productive guys in certain aspects of their career. They're not making big plays down the field at all. We're five games into the season, John. Dak Prescott has five touchdowns in five games. Four interceptions. He's been sacked nine times. They don't have a heavy-duty running game, but they, they do have Tony Pollard, Dart, Dash, catch the ball out of the backfield. It's just not the same offense, and it, it kind of surprises me because Mike McCarthy is a guru, and I, I thought they'd come out flying, come out throwing, and just has not happened. But the defense, holy cow. Gus Bradley, he built his credentials with Pete Carroll in Seattle. Then he went to Atlanta, didn't do well as a head coach, got fired, moved around, wound up in Dallas. This guy is X and O's mad. He is really good at designing schemes against opposing quarterbacks and taking them out of the flow. Justin Herbert, meet Gus Bradley. This will be a tremendous challenge. <clears throat> Dallas is giving up 292 yards per game. Mm. 292 in a league where everybody gets about 400 every Sunday. Dallas has got 15 sacks. They do bring the heat. Dallas has got 11 takeaways. That secondary takes the ball away. Dallas on third down defense, 32% conversion rate. That's pretty doggone good. So as much as I like Herbert, and I'm waiting for the dynamics of Kellen Moore to kick in, I think it's going to be hard for them to go down the field and make a pile of plays. Conversely, Dallas has been dormant on offense. Like I say, Dak's got five TDs in five games. Ha! Ah, he's going against just a horrible defense. It doesn't have a big pass rush unless they blitz. And he's going against a much younger secondary now. Um, I'll be interested to see how Mike McCarthy attacks the Chargers downfield. Because they're gonna make they have to make it a throwing game because Herbert can hurt you. But I just think Prescott has got to take advantage of the ineffectiveness of the Chargers secondary. Who's gonna win? Somebody's gonna really be upset by nine o'clock on Monday night. Because <laughs> somebody's gonna be in big playoff trouble mm -hmm, right. with a third loss. And it doesn't get any easier for Dallas going forward on the schedule. And the Chargers go from this game to Arrowhead Stadium next weekend. Oh, wow. And they still got to go to Detroit. They still got to play Buffalo. They've got uh, two games with the Chiefs still on the schedule. Chargers' schedule gets rockier as we go. So tonight is huge for both of these teams. Your response? To me, both these teams strike me as being below expectation. You know, I think as fans of the Chargers or the Cowboys, you're just kind of feeling kind of meh. You know, they're disappointing. You figure there would be both teams would be a lot better. So going into this game, you know, it's going to be weird. I mean, Austin Eckler's back, right? So I think we can be excited about that as, as Charger fans. Wait, wait, did I just say I was a Charger fan? Oh, my God. Hacksaw, you're infecting me. <laughs> Again. <laughs> um, but uh, I, you see, I get sucked right back into this whole Charger thing all over again. But I, I, I think the Chargers are going to be in much better shape this week, um, you know, tonight, since they have Austin Eckler. But Dak Prescott, he going up against the number 32 defense in the league. This is he's going to find the golden touch again. People are going to say, hey, Dak Prescott's not as bad as we thought. I mean, this game could go either way, and uh, and there's going to be a ton of cowboy fans in SoFi tonight. Well, the color the color will be cowboy blue, <laughs> not not Charger Bolt blue. Okay, we got that. One other NFL note here. I'll throw this on that topic on the table. I'll be intrigued to hear what fans have got to say about Chargers Cowboys. Join us in the fans forum and this topic. Asking NFL fan who's with us on our live stream. Have you subscribed to NFL Sunday Ticket since it moved from DirecTV, where it had been for a chunk of years and successful, to YouTube? And here's the reason I ask it, because as a story just came out in the New York Times, you know, Amazon paid $2 billion for the DirecTV Sunday Ticket package. The contract had come up for renewal. 
and DirecTV had paid $1 billion per year over a whole chunk of years. Amazon just threw a ton of money on the table. The NFL, in normal operating circumstances, took all the money off the table. We're taking the games, the whole Direct TV package where you can watch any game you want. We're taking it to YouTube. Well, the New York Times did a story comparing the $2 billion that Amazon paid to the $1 billion that Direct TV paid. Amazon, by virtue of the start of the season, had 1.3 million subscribers to Sunday Ticket. Direct TV had 1.2 million. So Amazon didn't bump it way up. Now, granted, they're charging $399 or $499, which is $100 more than the $299 it was. The issue is Amazon is now facing a loss, a loss of like $500 to a $1 million because they only got 1.3 million subscribers. Amazon needed 4.5 million to crack the nut, to break even. Wow. They needed 4.5, and he only got 1.3. So I'm asking a question to John Q. Fan out there who's with us on live stream. Join us on Fans Forum. Did you subscribe? Did you go from Sunday Ticket on DirecTV? Have you joined the YouTube team? Or have you said, no mas? I'm not giving the NFL more and more and more money. John? Yeah, well, I don't sign up for this. I mean, I I, I um, have always been watching the games on Fox and CBS. I mean, even back in the day, you know, the NFC, remember they had CBS and the N- NBC had the AFC. Um, but that's a lot of money, you know, and I think if you're a hardcore fantasy football guy, you probably want to sign up for that. If you're betting a lot of money, you know, on your app or in Vegas, you want to sign up for that. But 500 bucks a month or $500 total for the season, that's a ton of money. So I can see why some people are, are not signing up. And it's also, you know, everything is changing in this space as people cut the cord. People are, are trying to find new ways to see the games. And we're in a period of transition. But if they needed four and a half million subscribers to, like you say, to kind of break even, to, and they only had one third of that. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty heavy bath that they're taking. So, but you were saying Amazon and you were saying YouTube. I was a little bit confused. I mean, it's YouTube that has the direct TV pack or right. has the Sunday ticket package. Right. Right. Okay. I, th- I think in the, in a big overview, I'm wondering if the fans are starting to get really peeved that also the NFL is charging them for all this extra stuff like, Do you know where Thursday night football is now? Can you find Thursday night football? Because Thursday night football used to be a staple of, hey, NFL's on Thursday. Now i got to pay for it. Well, it's on Amazon Prime. I know. And I already subscribed to that. So it's like no big deal. But at some point, it gets to be troublesome if you've got to have like 13 different subscriptions to be able to see all of your games. And that was the beauty of having it on cable is that you had one fee and it covered everything, mostly. Um, And now we're trying to like you get YouTube TV, but then there's one exception or another exception. I mean, I've got subscriptions to to well for sports related stuff to direct tv stream to um amazon um and um i'm going to be re- i'm going to be switching now in a moment cuz i'm on direct tv stream to get the padre games so now the padre season is over i'm going to probably go back to youtube tv so i can get cbs sports network so i can watch aztec basketball Complicated. It, it's complicated. Here, sign here. Just give me your credit card. <laughs> so, hey, fans forum, we just gave you three topics out of the gate in the first half. Give us your response. Hey, by the way, our podcast is brought to you by the good people at Dixie Line Lumber and Home Center Stores. Nine locations to serve you in San Diego. You got projects for the fall and the winter. We want you to take a tour of Dixie Line. Find out what they've got to offer Dixie Line Home Center Stores. We get to halftime. When we come back, we just covered NFL football. When we come back, we're going to talk college football. And we got baseball to talk about, too. Thanks for being with us as our Monday bonus podcast continues. And a reminder, at Dixie Line Lumber Home Center Stores, they do projects. John, they do unbelievable projects. We're going to roll a video here that just tells you who Dixie Line is and what they've accomplished. But you and I have done business with Dixie Line for years. 
You said 100 years have been in business in Southern California, nine locations in San Diego. These people know how to help people do projects at their home or business. Yeah, and it's terrific. It's, the cool thing is, is you can drive your car into the lumber yard and they'll load you up. You don't have to get like one of those big shopping carts on wheels and, and schlep it out to your car in the parking lot. You just drive into their lumber yard. They got dudes there that'll lift up all the heavy stuff, put it in the back of your pickup, and you're on your way. So they make it really easy. This is what Dixie Line Lumber and Home Center stores are all about. Pay attention. And as we go to the second half of our Monday bonus podcast, there are two words that are really important for our podcast, John. Subscribe and share. Mm -hmm. Explain fans for them and explain how those people on our live stream and those who view us during the course of the week can become part of our team. Yeah, those people, those people. Yeah, already those people include Christopher and Dale and Tate and Gary and Ramon and Caesar and Angel are already queued up, lined up in the fans forum. If you've got questions or comments, jump on in. Just type in your question or comment for Hacksaw in the live chat on Facebook or YouTube. And a reminder, we want you to tell everybody what we do bonus podcast on Monday, our Thursday regular podcast, and subscribe so you can get alerted because we do things every day of the week, adding things to our YouTube channel. And if you like sports, check my website, leehacksawhamilton.com. If you check it every night or early in the morning, you'll have all the stories there are. We covered the NFL. Let's talk college football. I mean, what a weekend it was for the Pac-12. I mean, this should be glory years for the Pac-12, but instead it's a swan song. Something for everyone. Hype, big plays, big blitzes, quarterbacks down the field, moments to remember. What an unbelievable series of games we had. Let's start with Oregon-Washington. Farewell tour for the Pac-12 conference. It's the year of the quarterback. It That was classic. It may not get any better this year than what we saw at uh, Seattle, at uh, Husky Stadium. Oregon loses to Washington. Unbelievable. 1,055 combined yards offensively. Michael Penix throws four more touchdown passes, throws for 302 yards, obviously pushing his name into the Heisman Trophy conversation. Bo Nix threw for 337 and a couple of touchdowns. Ducks had 541 yards in offense. They were going up and down the field. But the Huskies had the total of 415 yards in offense. It was a classic game decided on the final possessions. And of course, there were goal line stands too. It was an electric game. USC Notre Dame. The Trojans, John, are in big trouble. Trojan club members in San Diego, Trojan fans in Los Angeles, you got a big problem. Not that you lost one game, but you got a big problem because your defense still can't stop people, and a bigger problem where people have figured out the offensive line, and now Caleb Williams is under siege. He's been sacked 10 times in the last two Saturdays. Wow. Uh, he threw for only 199. He was hit eight other times. He was pressured 11 times beyond that. And... USC can't solve it because they're playing the best they have in the offensive line, and their defense just isn't very good. Irish had five takeaways. They had six quarterback sacks, and the Irish just put together a phenomenal performance, which also included a 99-yard kickoff return for a touchdown. And why do I say USC's in trouble? Aside from the fact their offensive line is now exposed, and people are getting all this on video now, and all these coaches will figure they can't block this. This is what we're going to do against them. In addition to the defense not being able to stop people down the field, they have to play Oregon, Washington, and UCLA the second half of the schedule. Hmm. They look to me like they're in real trouble. UCLA, Oregon State, the kid Dante Moore, the freshman quarterback under fire. He really struggled up in Corvallis, threw for 165, Three picks, most of them very early, panicked. Six quarterback sacks along the way. And the defense that had played so well in the prior couple of weeks just looked gassed in the game against Oregon State. So now UCLA has gotten punched in the mouth, and they still got big games on their schedule. Arizona, Washington State up in Pullman. They got a quarterback issue at Arizona. 
Both of them are really good. Jaden uh, Jaden Delora, who had transferred from Washington State to Arizona, has played there for two years and put up really good numbers. He got hurt, and here comes Noah Fafita. And this kid is Polynesian. He threw for 342 in Pullman against a pretty heady Cougar defensive team. Jed Fish is building that program at Arizona. I mean, he's going to drag this thing from the Pac-12 into the Big 12, and they're they're going to be scary because he's got a lot of skill, talent. So Arizona wins at Washington State. Stanford, Colorado. My head was spinning. So was <laughs> Colorado's defense. They had a 29-0 lead, and they lost it. And Stanford, which does not have great firepower, just lit it up. They lost 46-43 in double overtime. Shadur Sanders threw for 400, five touchdowns for Colorado, but he also threw costly interceptions. Um, They're making a lot of mistakes there. He's throwing into coverages. He should not be throwing into coverages, trying to make some plays. And it kind of looks like they've run out of defensive players. So, you know, and their schedule is not going to get easy because they still got they still got games to be played, including they got to go play UCLA. So, a real real tough run right now for Colorado. Uh, and I think the other thing that really bothered me, and I've, I've noticed this over the stretch of games they played, they play fast, they play physical, and Colorado plays over the line. They do a lot of cheap stuff in games, and I don't know whether it's showtime and trying to back up their bravado, who they are, and us against the world. You can't take 17 penalties no way. for 121 yards. I think they lead the entire nation in penalty flags. And all this, I think, is a spinoff of the persona of Neon Dion, Coach Prime. This is who we are and what we're going to do. Well, you're not going to do it if it's illegal. And I've seen so much cheap stuff out of bounds and late hits on quarterbacks. It's killing them. I mean, they drew 17 penalties in the game against Stanford. I think the week prior they had 14 flags. So I wish they'd change that aspect of the game. Your reaction to college football, it was a classic weekend. It was an unbelievable weekend. And that, you're right, my head was spinning watching that Stanford-Colorado game. And it was clear that, you know, these guys in Colorado, they just don't have their act together. I think they're, they're all high and mighty. They've got a lot of skilled guys, a lot of talented guys. But they just can't win in the trenches at all. And they just got overwhelmed. And I saw uh, uh, Dion just ripping his team um, the today. It was like, or maybe it was yesterday. It was the day after the game, just basically saying, you guys are not working hard enough. You're not putting in your, your due diligence during practice. And he was calling them out. And so I think at one level, you know, when you have Coach Prime, you attract a lot of these sort of, I don't know how I could say it, these, you know, showtime, you know, kind of uh, players, but you also kind of attract that element that wants to, you know, play a little bit dirty. But Dion doesn't coach that way. Dion coaches clean and he wants to see his guys play well. So they're going to have to really step up. But the question I have for you, Lee, is with the way that, that Caleb Williams struggled and the way that Penix won the big game over Oregon, does Michael Penix move into first place for the Heisman Trophy? I think it's it's too early to say that because we've still got the whole back half of the schedule to play. But I, I think that Caleb Williams was the odds-on guy going in the front door, no doubt about it. Shadur Sanders, because he's played so well statistically against a Huge schedule. They may have played the toughest front end schedule of anybody in college football. I think he puts himself in there. Bo Nix is a different type of quarterback. He makes a lot of plays, but he's not. There's not a lot of pizzazz to what Bo Nix does. He runs the game and he makes passes. He runs the bootlegs. He runs the ball some. Penix is throwing on every down, and he's doing against the, the whole world. Knows what they're doing, and they're going to defend him that way. You know, I. I watched him, and they were dropping six and seven into coverage, and he was still throwing for a ton of yards. <laughs> so I, I think Penix has pushed himself into the conversation. I just think it's way too early to say, you know, this this guy is going to win this thing because there's a lot more games to be played. And we'll see if Caleb Williams can come around or if they can help him better because he was a house of fire first three weeks of the season. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, he's he's not doing now what he did before because he's under such – Enormous pressure. I mean, he got treated like a rag doll by Arizona two weeks ago. And wow. then this past weekend, Notre Dame just beat the daylights out of him. 
<laughs> after they beat the offensive line off the line of scrimmage. So, um, yeah, these guys are all in the mix for the Heisman, but it's a little bit too early to say, hot guy going to run away with it, because I'm not sure that because Caleb Williams isn't getting a lot of help that they're going to run away with it. I had a question for you about Bo Nix, because he was at – was Auburn. it Auburn? Yeah, before he we went to Oregon. Why did he transfer? Did he lose the starting job I at Auburn? There was coaching changes, and no, he he was the starter, I think, for about a year and a half. Mm-hmm. But I think he wanted to go somewhere to be in an offensive system where he could really shine. Because in Auburn, what do they do? They run the ball. Bro, okay, and they run go. the ball, and they run the ball a little bit more. <laughs> so I, I think that probably had something to do, and Oregon obviously was pretty flashy with all the offense that they've run. Okay, we go from football. Let's talk baseball. Baseball. I mean, th- we're getting down to the final four now, and our buddy Bruce Bochy is in the ALCS. I mean, this is these both these series are going to be great. Well, I mean, the headline pick 'em pal. Those are the ones I'm picking to go to the World Series. Texas has really stun gunned Houston. You know, the Rangers won the first game. They they shut out Texas. They beat Justin Verlander. Justin Verlander has won 13 games in postseason. That's type Hall of Fame credentials yeah. in the playoffs, and they beat him. And then they jumped on Framber Valdez in game two, scored four runs in the first inning, and Houston was trying to dig out of that hole. And so Houston shot its two best active pitchers. And Texas is such a diverse offense. I mean, Corey Seager, Marcus Simeon are the names everybody understands. But this young right fielder, Odalis Garcia, has come out of nowhere. I think he had 39 home runs in the regular season. He's a threat to bomb it anytime. I am surprised that Texas has kind of choked off Jordan Valdez and Alex Bregman and Jose mm-hmm. Altuve so far. So we'll see. I mean, it's, if, if this thing winds up being 2-0 and then they, they go to the other guy's place and play the next three, We'll see if the Astros can climb back in it. But Houston's a little bit wafer thin uh, in in pitching right now that they shot the two big guys. In Texas, they got the wild card in their, in their bullpen. They got Max Scherzer back. Wow. Now, he's not going to start, uh, but he has fully recovered through a 60-pitch bullpen at the end of last week. So there could be a long reliever situation where Scherzer's asked to come in and give him three or four innings rather than being the front-line starter. But it's really cool to see Bruce Bochy in the dugout and having all this success. Uh, could you imagine if Bochy got this team with the Giants he managed and with the Padres he managed in the World Series? Got this team into the World Series? Three. Holy, holy cow. <laughs> uh, you know, Poway proud. Yo, no uh, doubt. Hall of Fame guy. Mm-hmm. Definitely Hall of Fame manager. Uh, other series, Philadelphia. <laughs> Philadelphia. Philadelphia, Arizona. Uh just tell me, smart guy, mm-hmm. who are you pitching around in the Philly lineup? Who are uh, you trying to avoid? Um, yeah, <laughs> really. I mean, yeah. I mean, who, the only guy you can maybe pitch to is that Stott kid that plays second base, yeah. and he can still hit bombs. Man, oh man, how do you get those people out? And at Citizens Bank Ballpark, they will be banging home runs. Harper, Rio Muto, Schwarber, Castellanos, Trey Turner, even Brad Marsh. That's a pretty scary lineup. Like I said, dude, who are you pitching around? Yeah. So uh, there's so much swagger in Philadelphia. I mean, they're overbearing fans to begin with. And now there's so much swagger with Philly fan and with the team. And they got big-time starters led by Zach Wheeler. <laughs> big-time bullpen. And the brotherly love Bash Brothers. Man, they just swing in sticks, and they don't care about strikeouts or the fact that Schwarber's hitting 199, and he's got 54 home runs. I mean, what a persona of a baseball club. In Arizona, I mean, once you get beyond Zach Gallen, I don't, I don't know what Arizona's got beyond that. I mean, they say that Merrill Kelly mm-hmm. is the number two starter, but we're not talking about a state-of-the-art 20-game winner there. And no. This is Philly's batting order. So mm-hmm. Philadelphia's just got – they got – checked off every box of a way to win. Uh, it, it, they're a really, really good team. So, I pick them, pal. I got Texas and Philadelphia going to the World Series. And John broadcasting from left field. Says, <laughs> from left field. Well, first of all, all the swagger that's going on with the Phillies, that was supposed to be the Padres, you know, with all the big home run hitters and the Bash brothers and everything else. And it just never turned out. So, 
you know, I, I saw a tweet earlier today from Tim Flannery, and he's just saying, well, you know, we got these old school managers, Dusty Baker, Bruce Bochy, and, uh, you know, we don't care about launch angles and all these analytics. It's all about, you know, going off your gut. And, you know, we got to trust these old school managers. Uh, so I'm happy for Bochy. I mean, if he got to the World Series a third time, wouldn't that be terrific? Awesome. I want the Astros just to go down in flames for their cheating scandals. I just, they're a disgrace. And every time I see Bregman and Altuve, I just want, I want to see them fail. I mean, I know it sounds <laughs> horrible. So I, I'm, I'm with Texas. I would love to see the Diamondbacks beat the Phillies. And I know that's improbable, but that the third pitcher in their, in their rotation is that kid. What is it? Fat that starts with a PF. Yes. Um, he's actually pretty good. And, but they sent him down to the minors earlier in the year because he didn't really have his act together, but he's been really good at the tail end of the season. So they've got, you know, you look at that um, that batting or, or the batting order. They've got a lot of like they're, the guys that are sort of quiet, but they get the job done. And it's not just Corbin Carroll. They've got a lot of talented guys there. So I'm rooting for Arizona to win. But I mean, yeah. You go in a you know that that band box in Philadelphia, and they're playing that that bell from the Rocky movie, you know, <laughs> just to get everyone hyped up. That's going to be a tough place for Arizona to win. I just I just hate to pile on, but Bryce Harper in Philadelphia, personality and style, is everything that Manny Machado and the Padres are not. Exactly, and that just really bothers me. Yeah, it's exactly that. Okay. <laughs> we go from baseball. Let's talk about some other interesting storylines out here. Hockey. I mean, no one talks hockey like you, Hacksaw. Gulls. I told you last week I thought they had a chance to really be decent out of the gate with all these young guys that the Anaheim Ducks were sending down from the NHL. Well, they didn't get all the young draft picks here. But what they got was a cross-section of good goaltending, really deep on defense, You add into the equation some guys who can score. The goals go on the road. They go to Ontario. They beat the L.A. Kings top farm club, and they really beat them up. And they got 75 saves out of their goaltenders. I mean, it was was a really stunning win Friday night. Alex Stalock, a former Chicago Blackhawk goaltender, whom the Ducks signed late, sent here. He's a veteran. He's here, three NHL veteran defensemen, and then the collection of all the young kids. Stalock had 40 saves on the first night. They played the Swedish rookie, Kelly Klang, the second game. He had 35 saves. (laughs) And the goals win back-to-back games in Ontario, which is a tough place to play. So the goals are back home. Pavel Regenda scored five goals uh, in the first two games. Right winger, Jacob Perot had a couple. And they have the veterans on defense that really stabilized everything in front of Stalock and in front of Klang. So here's my thought. San Diego, I think, is a really good hockey town. Have not Has not had good teams the last two years with the Gulls. And, of course, prior to that, they had to leave because of COVID, and they played up in Anaheim. Friday night, home opener. That I bet the Pechanga Arena is going to be a madhouse. And, of course, the Gulls have something kind of cool. I call it Beer Friday. <laughs> they they really, I mean, they have all these special promotions on Friday. Mm-hmm. If you've never been to a hockey game or you're a goals fan who kind of got lost, you need to go back and sample this team right now, Beer Friday. And by the way, the enemy, Ontario Reign, they'll be in here. It'll be third game in a row that they play Ontario before the Ducks then embark on the rest of the American Hockey League schedule. So there's potential. Uh, I, I don't think... Everybody in Anaheim with the Ducks is going to be on that roster for a long period. I still think a couple of those high draft picks are going to wind up here. This has the potential to be a really good team. So if you're a hockey fan, you need to sample Beer Friday. It's kind of cool, the sports arena. That sounds great. I mean, I, but I went to a goals game last year, and it was it was a great experience. And there are a lot of really hardcore goals fans. I mean, they show up in their gear, and they're ready to go. I mean, the fans here in San Diego. And it's, it's to me, you know, as a sports guy that I follow baseball, football, basketball, I don't give enough attention personally to hockey. But uh, the more I learn about it, the more I understand 
how great the sport is. And I also understand how San Diego is a legitimate hockey town. I think it's great. But I just like listening to the old hockey stories from you. <laughs> I mean, you know, being on the bus with all those guys in your in your early broadcasting career, like when it was like slap shot. I mean, you got any more of those stories, Hacksaw? No, it's just that it's a different culture. I, I, I do <laughs> have to excuse me. I'm fighting a cold here. I will tell you this. I always covered hockey as a talk show host in San Diego because we were on a big signal. And I covered it because, A, I'm a fan of the NHL, and I came from a hockey background. But I also knew with our big signal, the old extra 690, and even at the mighty 1090, that our signal was busting into L.A. and busting into Anaheim. And obviously, home of the Ducks, home of the Kings. So we did so much coverage of the NHL, and we got so much response. I, I think back to... The night the L.A. Kings traded for Wayne Gretzky. I mean, it set the NHL on its ear. Oh, yeah. People responded. I mean, it was such a monstrous trade to get Gretzky from the Edmonton Oilers. And Peter McNall, the owner, was just, you know, he was a doer. And he paid a tremendous price. But Gretzky got here and got, got the Kings to the Stanley Cup. And San Diego has a great tradition of minor league hockey going back to the old Western Hockey League. You know, John, you and I have talked about the original six. Yes. Well, the original six meant there were a lot of hockey players who never got to the NHL. And those guys wound up in the old American Hockey League and what was then the old Western Hockey League. And there were guys who were making tons of money playing in the Western Hockey League, some of the San Diego Gulls. So I knew there was a legacy and, and fairly successful run of minor league hockey here. And they had gone to the World Hockey Association with the Mariners and didn't have great success. It only lasted three years before the NHL, WHA wound up merging and San Diego got left out. But the thing that drove home the point of how cool a hockey market this place is, is what happened right after they announced we're putting an AHL franchise in San Diego. Mm -hmm. The Anaheim Ducks, who had their AHL team in Norfolk, Virginia, moved it back here. And they had a fans fest greet the team on a Sunday in February, and they drew 8,500 at the sports arena. Holy moly. I was staggered. And I, I walked through the concourse before the event started because I was one of the MCs, and nobody wore clothes. Everybody wore... <laughs> Wait, nobody wore clothes? <laughs> well, let me finish the statement here. Everybody... I mean, this is in winter, and it was yeah. cold. Yeah. And people showed up in Maple Leaf jerseys, and Ranger jerseys, oh, and nice. Montreal jerseys, yeah. and old Detroit Red Wing original six jerseys, and Blackhawk jerseys. I mean, it was phenomenal how many fans were there. And the first group of years, this team led the American League which has been in existence since the 1920s, let them in attendance. And they were, I mean, and on weekends, they were getting nine to 10,000. And after Christmas, they were getting eleven to 12,000. Nice. Now, you kind of drifted away because the team had to go to Anaheim during the COVID for two years. So we had no home games here and no fans in the building. And the last two seasons have been substandard. So that being said, I think this is just a really good hockey town. And if they put a good product on the field, and by the way, you like Beer Friday, I, I sample it. I think you'll enjoy it. That's my statement on hockey. One other topic on the table. We're going back to corner kicks here. Okay, one more topic on the table. Yeah, Team USA. I mean, they're back, huh? Well, Greg Berhalter is back. He has signed this contract extension after being away, uh, coming right out of the controversy involving the World Cup. Uh, Gia Reyna is back. They have solved that issue. He is on the roster. Uh, Team USA is playing what they call friendlies. Uh, they're 2-1 and one in friendlies since Burhalter returned. Uh, they did lose to Germany on the weekend, 3-1. Uh, Burhalter's defense really struggled. But he's trying to mix and match. They play Ghana on Tuesday night. That'll be the next friendly. Uh, the I thing that excites me is the players buy into Burhalter's system. Uh, it has become talent and team, not individual or star. But they got Pulisic, they got Weston McKinney. Those are some of the veterans. Matt Turner has become a star keeper. What he's doing in the English Premier League right now is really impressive. Uh, Reyna is there. 
Uh, Fab Belogan, who can score goals, is starting to find himself at this international level. They got Ricardo Pepe, who has scored goals in some of the friendlies. The young guy, uh, Alejandro Zendejas, they got veterans on defense. So they played Ghana Tuesday night. So I, I think the picture is clear. Burhalter system works. The players have bought into the coach and the way they're playing. And I think the arrow is pointing up for Team USA soccer <clears throat> as they work towards um, what will be World Cup 2026. So we'll continue to track them as they go. But everything has fallen into place, and now they've added these new guys, young pups, who mm-hmm. Burhalter will drive and try to mold to fit the system that he wants to run. Well, then they just played Germany, right? And and yeah. that was a tough go for the team. I mean, to go against the world class, you know, n- national teams. I'm I'm a big fan of Team USA, and they're just a lot of fun to root for. They had that disappointing World Cup, like not last World Cup, but the one before, where they got, you know, they didn't even qualify. DNQ, and that was awful. But it's nice to see the progression of this team. And we knew in the last World Cup they were young, they were inexperienced, but they were growing up together. And so when the World Cup rolls around, what's the next one? At 26, 26, 26 they're going to be in a good spot, I think, you know, to be a competitive team. And hopefully they can get deep into the knockout rounds. I think one of the coolest things, and I've interviewed him one time, uh, is to see Christian Pulisic go from a teenager to a developing player to a young veteran leader who now suddenly understands he can play at this level. You know, him going abroad, uh, and now he's playing in Italy this year after having gone up and down at Chelsea in England. But he is, the way he carries himself on the pitch, the way he plays, the way he dominates, the way he sets up shots, the way he gets open to make his shots, to see him go from a 17- and 18-year-old to where he is now, that's pretty cool. And... He's the flag carrier for the whole thing, and now they got all these other young guys that are going to try to follow Pulisic and grow into the job. Yeah, well, he's a grown man now, so he can he can use his body and knock people around as he needs to. Uh, but yeah, this is just terrific to watch him. I'm glad Burhalter is back. Seems like he's kissed and made up with Gio Reyna and their family, and that controversy has kind of gone to the back burner, right? <laughs> it has. On we go. Fans forum coming up. You got a question? We got an answer. You got a statement to make. We'd like to hear it. You want to take one of us on, both of us on. That's okay. You're the one that will wind up losing. You can't argue with talk show hosts. But do (laughs) want to remind you, our podcast is brought to you by Dixie Line Lumber, Home Center Stores, nine locations in San Diego. Whatever the project is, when you need supplies, you need Dixie Line Lumber. Build it. Fix it. We guarantee you will enjoy it in the fall. John, you got questions. I know we got answers. Well, hopefully you're up for it. I know you're kind of struggling through this, Lee, battling the head cold, but we got a lot of people commenting here. And there's a lot of people fired up about tonight's game, the Chargers Cowboys. And here's Dale. He says, when you run at Parsons, he has the most problems, as great as he is. Well, you got to be able to run. You know, the offensive line has to run block, and they've not been able to do it with any consistency at all. Now, <clears throat> the Chargers obviously want to throw the ball, and they want to not only need to throw it down the field, obviously they spread the field, and they're going to throw it to Austin Eckler. But Parsons comes from everywhere. In modern-day football, I don't think I've seen anybody as complete and as fast at the linebacker position who can play different roles, line them up outside and send them, line them up inside almost as if he's a defensive tackle and send them. Drops into coverage. He's a complete football player. So I think it's going to be a good game. I, I, I think the Chargers can do a lot of things moving the football. I'm worried about what the Chargers can do defensively because I just think there's an ex- explosion that's going to happen involving De- Dak Prescott. They're going to get this offense dialed in, and it better get dialed in tonight because their season's going to be they're going to be in a, a tough corner if they lose their third game this early in the campaign. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to tonight's game. I think it's going to be terrific. Hey, we got a, a motorsports <laughs> question here. Auto racing. This is from Tate. He says, Kyle Larson can be the first in motorsports history to win two major championships in two major racing categories in the same year. Um, so he goes on. He leaves a link. But he says, NASCAR Cup for the second time after being banned by NASCAR in 2020 and coming back to kick ass. He's really rallied back. And, of course, he won on Sunday in, in a really interesting race. Uh, you know, he's he's a fine young driver. He got a little sidetracked 
I mean, I th- no. when he first arrived, he was so hot and he won so much. I thought, and he's such an interesting personality. I said, is this the next coming of Dale Earnhardt? Mm. And it, it didn't happen because he got himself sidetracked for some stuff he did off the track and some of his comments. But he's a really good driver. It, it, the NAS, NASCAR championship is weird because they've come up with this playoff system. And I don't know that the whole world identifies with this playoff. You know, when they, they went from 16 down to 12, and now there's down the, down to the final eight. And if you're in the final eight and you win, you're still eligible to win the big prize, $5 million prize at the end of the season. I don't know if fans are as in tuned to this playoff structure as they were before when it was just Earnhardt and Waltrip and all the good old boys going after each other Sunday by Sunday. But no, Kyle Larson's really, really good. You know, it's amazing is that anybody can ask you any sports related question and boom, you've got the information at the top of your head. You're the franchise. As John Belushi in Saturday Night Live. You're right. I'm bleeping brilliant. <laughs> I like it all. All right. Next question. OK, this is from Gary. And he says, Sunday ticket was free from Direct TV for the last year. I haven't bought it from YouTube. Too expensive for what you get. It was interesting. I think it was the Washington Post did a survey a random survey of thousands of NFL fans and said, have you bought Sunday tickets since it's gone to the, you know, new, new to YouTube? 79% of the people they surveyed said no. 79% said no to the NFL. I just, the, you know, I had got sticker shock with a price tag. My mind was two ninety nine, I think. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden I got this directive in the mail. Subscribe now. four ninety nine. Whoa. So I didn't, uh, and I miss it, but I didn't. If, if it's re- really a most unique game, I'll go to a pub with you, and we'll watch it at the pub. Mm-hmm. Uh, but 79% said, no, they did not subscribe. And even though they jacked the prices up, to only get $1.3 million when they needed $4.5 million to break even, that's what they call loss leader. That's yeah. an awful lot of, quote, loss, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Well, I think, you know, it's interesting how the NFL is such a a cash cow, you know, and, and everything is driven by money in that league. And with inflation and everything else getting more expensive and tickets for the games being more expensive, they keep raising the bar to see how far fans are willing to keep spending money. Maybe this is the limit. Maybe they've kind of hit a point where they're like, enough's enough. Um, but, uh, you know, it's also it's similar to what's going on with the Padres when they lost their television contract. And, you know, people are now having to pay a la carte for it, and some people are hesitant. So it's just there's a lot of things swirling around with sports media these days. And here's the asterisk to that sentence you just talked about. This hasn't gotten out yet. National Football League is negotiating to take the Super Bowl out of the U.S. You kill Take it. the Super Bowl to London, England. Wow. Global dollars, pal. Mm. And it's all a money grab. Now, now, maybe the fans just watch it on TV because it is the Super Bowl and it is an event. But if it's not, not going to be in Los Angeles or it's not going to be in Miami or wherever, it's going to be in London at Wembley Stadium. And they'll charge... Boku bucks for that for whoever goes to see the game in London. So I don't know. Would you be offended if the Super Bowl was abroad? Well, I, I wouldn't be offended by that. I'm offended that they don't have the Super Bowl in San Diego. I mean, that's supposed to be the greatest place for it. So, yeah, the one thing after another, but they're definitely going global. Okay, next question. Moving on. And this is from Caesar, and he says, 1994 was the last year I watched every NFL game. I only watch the score tracker now because I don't have the patience for so many commercials. Well, there's no doubt that commercials and advertising inventory drives the broadcast, which then drives ratings, which then drives the price tag that goes to the National Football League. Um, I'm, I miss not seeing or not getting access to different games during the course of other games, but that's my choice not to spend the $499 for a direct TV. But as John and I talked about, we can go have a beer and sit in a sports bar and look at all their games that they have on. So I guess we can get our fill just differently. But the money, the money issue is a big thing. You know, 
how much is too much? How much can John Q. Fan afford to pay? Yeah, it's it, they're asking a lot. And by the way, 1994, that was a good year in the NFL, wasn't it, Lee? Uh, last I checked, that was the year we wound up going to the Super Bowl. Yeah. As the voice of the Chargers. It was about the last good thing we had to experience with <laughs> the Bolts. Okay, let's move on. This is from John. And he says, when the Rams, Chargers, and Raiders moved from all the places I'd lived in, I gave up on the NFL. NFL stands for no fan loyalty, <laughs> leaving to attend the Caps-Flames game. Well, a big hockey fan. I think he is based in, in the nation's capital, in the District of Columbia. Um, you know, teams, teams don't move very often, but the NFL has obviously been pockmarked by how the owners of those three teams treated those communities. Um, all of it driven by stadiums, but indirectly it's all driven by greed. And the NFL has changed. And But it's you know, <coughs> big money. Big money is driving everything in every sport. Mm-hmm. Major League Baseball, NBA has now put their media rights up for bid. National Hockey League has done the exact same thing. So landscape has changed just a different world it's just not enjoying the games it's paying a lot of money to go enjoy the games well they keep um you know raising the prices of tickets and the padres keep selling out these other nfl teams keep bringing in more people you know they just keep ratcheting it up you know waiting to see when the fans are going to back off and while we're starting to see it with television but just similar to john real quick i was like him when the chargers moved i was done with the nfl Then I started doing the podcast with you, and I'm sucked right back in. Okay, uh, let's move on. This is from Ramon. He says, rocking with the saw since the 80s, from Baja to the Canadian Rockies. You got that right, and we were (laughs) correct the way we designed Sports Talk Radio, and I was the first one through the wall to do it. And it wasn't easy, but we got great response. And it's, it's so cool to see how many people are sampling what we're doing now with our Monday bonus podcast and our regular Thursday podcast. Just a reminder, subscribe so you'll know what we're doing and share it so everybody else knows who we are. Yeah, all right, right on. So let's move on down the line here. and Let's go to Angel. He says, with the way they lost to Notre Dame, is it safe to say that USC playoff hopes have been shot? I wouldn't say it's it's a deadlock that they won't make it, but they got a problem because what's left on the USC schedule, the Ducks – the Huskies, and cross town, the Bruins. And now that everybody has their problems on tape, and now they know you can't protect Caleb Williams because people are designing blitzes to come after him. Now Southern Cal's got a huge problem. How are they going to get through the back half of the schedule, get this quarterback upright so he can do what he does and he does it really well? rather than running all over the field trying to protect himself. I mean, the last two games, the hits he's taken and what they've done to get him out of the pocket and everything breaks down. I mean, it's phenomenal what Arizona did. Arizona ambushed him with blitzes that I'd never seen before. And USC couldn't block it. And then the same thing happened in South Bend. And guarantee you, every team that's left on the Trojan schedule, they got all those videos and they'll design things off what, the Wildcats and the Irish did to the Trojans, they're going to make life really, really hard. And on the other side of the dollar bill, Alex Grinch's defense, terrible. Pass defense, terrible. Secondary. Yeah, they get sacks. They do get tackles for losses. But that doesn't mean anything if you're giving up a 24-yard pass on the very next series. So USC's not out of it, but USC's got problems, I think. Well, do you think um, at the end of the season, Grinch survives? A lot of people didn't think he should have survived last year. Right. A lot of people didn't think he should have come from Oklahoma with Lincoln Riley. Yeah, he didn't certainly didn't deserve it. He, they had a terrible defense there. Yeah, exactly. So that's the answer to your question. We go on. We go on. Let's go to SG Sports Talk Channel. I'm going with the Cowboys over the Chargers, winning this game 52-24 to 24 from SoFi Stadium. Well, I think the, the tenacity and the athleticism of the Dallas defense will slow Justin Herbert down. But I don't know where you're going to get 52 points from the Dallas offense, even though they're playing a, what I think is a substandard Charger defense. Uh, that's not a Dallas offense has been very explosive. You know, I spin back to the set of stats I gave you right at the top of our podcast. Dak Prescott's got five touchdowns and four picks in five games. Five games. This is Dak Prescott that would normally have 
12 touchdowns in his first five games. So they're not going down the field. They're not completing a lot of passes. The receivers don't look like the receivers that we saw a year or so ago. So I don't know if they can put 52 up on the bolts, but I do think it's conceivable that Dallas is really good defense, second ranked on the planet, pass defense, good pass rush. Dallas's defense could hold the Chargers to 24. Yeah, it's going to be a good game. I'm looking forward to it. 52, that's that's a lot. A lot of points. Anyway. How are you feeling, Lee? Are you, are you able to hang in here with us for a bit more? Or? We're playing hurt. Let's go through a few more. <laughs> okay, playing hurt. Let's go to Manny. And he says, will USC be happy to be playing in San Diego or El Paso for their bowl game? That would be devastating if that happened. Uh, they'd go to a, they'd still go to a big bowl game if if this thing doesn't finish like we thought it would. But I got an alternative question for San Diego fan with us on our live stream, John, because this the Holiday Bowl will match somebody from the Pac-12 versus somebody from the Atlantic Coast Conference. Well, it's not going to be Oregon. It's not going to be Washington. Mm-hmm. Probably won't be USC. Based on how UCLA treated the Holiday Bowl. A year ago during the COVID, oh, yeah. I yeah. would not invite you to no lay back. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's the way it is. How about Coach Prime, Neon Dion, Colorado coming to the Holiday Bowl? Would that be a stroke of genius for the Holiday Bowl people mm-hmm. to pull that off? I mean, Colorado might wind up with five losses. I mean, their schedule has taken a toll on them and not the same team now and how about Colorado playing somebody from the Atlantic Coast Conference? That'd be cool. It'd be really cool, but there's a lot of people think that Colorado's not going to win another game, and they oh, wouldn't be bowl eligible. Those same people are saying, well, they're going to go 1-11, and 11. this isn't going to work. Yeah, but I mean, the, the way they played against Stanford, and they just blew it, and they still got a lot of tough games ahead yeah. of them, so I don't know. Uh, but w- it would be great to see Coach Prime in San Diego. Yeah. It's early. It's way too early to be guesstimating <laughs> on, on bowl matchups. But uh, we'll just go look look in the standings, the Atlantic Coast Conference, and let's find somebody that's kind of sexy we might want to bring out here to play Coach Prime. I think I think that, that'd be a coup if my friends at the Holiday Bowl could execute the Colorado Buffaloes coming to San Diego. Yeah, oh, that'd be just great. All right. A couple Let, more. Yeah, let's go here. Look at um, Steve Zach uh, Botsford. Gotta love hockey season. The real sport. Toughest trophy in the world to go get. NHL Stanley Cup. It's tougher than any of the others. All those seven game series. So we've got a long hockey season ahead of us. Let's just see where it goes. But I'm violating. I'm violating the rule. No cheering in the press box. Okay. <laughs> I'm rooting for the Gulls to have a bounce back season, and I'm rooting for 12,000 people to show up on Beer Friday at Pachanga Arena and make a difference. Now, we got social media questions here, too, because I saw some of the stuff that you're going to preview on. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, there, there's a ton here. Let, let's, uh, let's get one in here about Dave Roberts. And, well, wait a minute here. I got to turn this off. And that on. And now here we go. This is from Jazz. And he said, Dave did not tell Mookie and Freddie to go one and 21 and Kershaw to blow up. Yes, he's made some bullpen mistakes, but sometimes players just don't show up. Well, sometimes guys get pitched around. Some guys try too hard. I mean, it was stunning that they went one for 21 at the top of the batting order. Uh, But at the end of the day, my only critique is, and this is just not Dave Roberts' fault. Because they don't make those pitching decisions in a vacuum. That's just not him. That's Mark Pryor. Well, that's the analytic guys upstairs. That's Andrew Friedman. They all meet. And they have all these numbers in front of them. And they say, this is what we think you should do if the starter gets in trouble. This ought to be the way the order works if you have to go to the bullpen. So the mistakes that he made, whether it's Kershaw or whether it's Lance Lynn starting on the road rather than at home, whether it's Bobby Miller, the rookie, starting at home after he had pitched well on the road, that's all a joint committee decision. So it's easy to critique and go after Dave Roberts, but let's be realistic. Analytics have changed the game, and that's a joint committee meeting. So at the end of the day, though, Roberts now has had, what, five postseasons and have been huge question marks about decisions with pitchers with him as manager. 
Well, the overwhelming commentary on social media is that Dodger fans want Dave Roberts gone. They're either angry with him and said he should have been gone last year, or other people are saying, well, we've kind of gone long enough with him. This is probably as far as he's going to go. But he, you know, he's a good guy. He's a good manager. I mean, he's a nice guy, but maybe he just doesn't have the right, uh, I know the, the the right secret sauce because he seems like he over manages and he makes decisions that are out of character than what he did in the regular season. Well, if that's the case, then Mark Pryor should be making the decisions because he's a former major league pitcher with all this experience and very highly regarded. But again, this is a team effort upstairs that's causing these problems. Next question. Okay, we got one here about the Angels and Showalter, and this is from Next Stop Willits Point. He says, the way the new administration under recently hired Mets president of baseball ops, David Stearns, handled Buck's dismissal in New York was a disgrace and makes absolutely no sense unless there is an under the table deal done between Craig Council and Stearns um, and, and Buck Showalter, regardless of the missing of the world championship. Buck is a proven winner and second to none as far as baseball experience and acumen. He would be a welcome addition in Anaheim in a post Otani world, assisting not only in the dugout, but the inevitable rebuild that may be about to take place in Anaheim. Agree with all of that. And Buck's not to blame for what happened at City Field. They lost all those pitchers. It wasn't his fault. Um, but you have a new president. And David Stearns comes in with a good reputation of building teams together. And David Stearns sat in the interview with Steve Cohen, the owner, and just made the opinion known, I come here, I make all the baseball decisions, top to bottom. And that includes whether or not to keep the manager or who we might hire as the general manager to work underneath me. So at the end of the day, Steve Cohen said, yes, you will have full autonomy to run the baseball side, which includes all these decisions. If I'm the Angels, I hire the guy. Guy's got almost 1,100 wins, been to the World Series, been in big markets, been in small markets, been through some good ownership, bad ownership. Guy still got juice, still got gas left in the tank. And I think there's an intangible. Based on his resume, hi, I'm Buck Showalter. Here's my calling card. Here's everything I've done. He sits down with Otani. And maybe he convinces Otani of a Buck Showalter game plan that would allow Otani to stay here. And then that changes everything as it relates to the persona of Angel Baseball. Now, granted, they, they still need pitching. They still have to figure out why they have so many guys that are getting hurt. But Buck Showalter walks in the door with one thing that we've not really had in a while, credibility. Yeah, for sure. I mean, imagine if, you know, the Rangers or the Astros win the World Series, you know, Bochi, D- um, Dusty Baker, and you know, it's going to people are going to say, hey, that's the model, right? We need an old school guy that, like you say, walks in the clubhouse, has instant credibility, and that's Buck Showalter. So um, I'm hoping he lands in Anaheim. I mean, Anaheim has so much potential to be a great franchise, and they constantly are stubbing their toe. So they, uh, they got to get this right. They could get it right right now because Buck told New York Post reporters last week, I'm going to manage next year, and I'd like to be out there in the 714 area code. Angels, do it. It makes a lot of sense. A couple more here. Okay, let's uh, talk about the MLB playoff format. And this is from uh, Kyle. And, uh, you know, they're talking about how the Dodgers could have lost this thing. He says, this isn't a mystery. Trevor Plouffe explained it on the Chris Rose rotation. Making MLB players go a week without a meaningful at-bat, then putting them back up to the plate, playing for their playoff lives, it just doesn't work. Well, there's a lot of yapping about five-day layoffs. Teams lose their momentum. Uh, Teams are also exhausted. Uh, The five-day layoff should be huge for every pitching staff, which is fatigued. 162-game schedules, a monster schedule, John. But, you know, years ago, when it was a one-game wild-card series, people were barking, well, it shouldn't be one game. You go through a whole (laughs) season and something bad happens in the first game and you're going home, make it best of three, which I kind of thought that was kind of cool. But best of three now leads to the five-day layoff for everybody else. Now, maybe you make everybody play immediately. Maybe you don't have buys. You know, maybe the number one team, which was the Atlanta Braves, are playing the last team that qualified as a wild card. 
Mm-hmm. Maybe you do that, and everybody starts playing best of three or best of five right from the get-go. I don't know there's a perfect scenario because the one-game plan, a lot of people, most people, didn't think it was very fair. Well, if you do that, Lee, you'd have to open it up to eight teams. Like right now, it's six per league. So imagine eight teams. Hey, the Padres might have made the playoffs. Um, but uh, I, I just think this is a weak excuse, um, you know, to say, well, you know, we had the buy, and that's to our disadvantage. Usually the buy is to your advantage. And if your guys, you know, they're going to be working out, they're still going to be taking cuts in the cage, maybe some live pitching. I mean, you can't use that as an excuse. I mean, come on. You know, I agree. Everybody's playing by the same rules. Right. For the most part. For the most part. Hey, listen, we hope you have enjoyed our Monday bonus podcast. A reminder, we're here Mondays. We're here Thursdays. We're brought to you by the good people at Dixie Line Lumber and Home Center Stores, nine locations in San Diego County. Whatever the project is, build it or fix it. We guarantee you by teaming up with Dixie Line, you will enjoy it. John, here comes Monday Night Football. We will be back Thursday. We'll set the stage for what's coming up on the Great Sports Weekend. Have yourself a great evening. Yeah, it's going to be a good night. And thanks to you for being with us on our Monday bonus podcast, Hacksaw's Headlines. Join us again for Hacksaw's Headlines on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. And find the audio version on your favorite podcast app. Touchdown, San Diego! For more content, go to LeeHacksawHamilton.com.